Are you nervous at the moment? Am I nervous right now? Yeah. yeah a little bit. <laughs> How do you cope with nerves? I mean, you've just, yeah, you know, not long since the Brit Awards, you have to come rushing onto the stage. How do you deal with nerves? I don't think I do, to be honest. I think I just kind of sit through them. Usually I, I sort of say silly things to make people laugh, maybe. Um, but, yeah, or I laugh nervously myself. When you say when you're standing in the wings, you don't, there's, not, there's nothing you do to make yourself manage to get on the stage. Is that moment, that sort of second before you go on? Um, I'll be honest with you, I usually have a couple of glasses of wine yeah. before I go on. Um, but I don't know if that's necessarily nerves because towards the end of the t my the last tour that I just did, I didn't. It was so hot because it was in Australia, so we're, you know, performing in sort of 40 degree heat in the middle of the day, and you just can't drink and perform in those, um, yeah, in that climate. So um, I didn't drink, and I d don't think I was particularly nervous. And you don't get nervous when you're on the stage, or uh, if if, so if you feel something's going out of control or something's not gone right or the little bit of business you're no, doing? No, I don't really mind that. I think it's more... I don't like sort of awkward silences, so I kind of feel like if I have a couple of drinks, I might be funnier and I might say something that makes people laugh more. But you're... I mean, this, this, it's, you're quite... You put yourself down a lot, don't you? You're quite self-deprecating. I mean, for example, I've come across a couple of things where you say, well, I'm not a musician at all. But you did a lot of music at school. I mean, you know, you did uh, piano, grade five, singing, grade eight, mm. guitar, trumpet, glockenspiel. I mean, you know, why, why, why don't you boast a bit more about that? Or why do you say I'm not a musician? Because you said that a couple of times. Um, well, because I did. I also learnt French and Spanish when I was at school. I was fluent in both languages, and I'm not now. And I'm not very good at the piano now, and I don't think I'm particularly good at singing either. But I, I um. There you go again. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't use those things in my writing now, so I suppose when I refer to being not a musician, I refer to my work currently, and I don't necessarily use my education in music for how I make music now. How much when you say that I'm not good at that, and you just said I'm not very good at singing either, I mean, is that just a way of, I mean, some people use the phrase backing shyly into the limelight, don't they, to suggest that really people say, well, I'm not really very good at this, in a way, it's a way of somehow saying, look, I'm not a superstar, but in a way it's also a way of saying I am. Well, I think um, it, it's it's a bit of that, and I think it's also because other people tell me that quite often. And, you know, I'll read, you know, it's not like I go looking looking for those pieces of information, but if I read, you know, for instance, the Daily Mail, um, it will frequently say how I'm untalented and, uh, you know, only exist in this industry because of my connections. Um, and I suppose, you know, if you're sort of slightly lacking self-confidence, you take those bits of information on board and they become fact pretty quickly. But you don't fight back against it. I mean, because, I mean, one of your heroes, for example, somebody like Dolly Parton, or something, you can't imagine her taking that, can you? I mean, she, she, or saying, I'm not very good. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps it's, you know, perhaps, but I wanted to, uh, let's, let's talk just a bit about it. Let's go back to, the, to, to, to school, because I, I couldn't believe when I read how many schools you'd been to. Mm. I really couldn't believe that. How many do you reckon you went to? Um, I think including nurseries, probably about 13 or 14. <laughs> what, how, how, can you remember uh, some you stayed out for, what, just a few months? And then wh why, why did you leave so suddenly? Why did you move so quickly? So many schools. Um... Well, I think a lot of reasons. My, my mother worked incredibly hard to provide us with, you know, with what she believed to be a good education. And I'm sure for people, some people that kind of education is brilliant. I always felt quite inferior to my peers, mainly because we went to really expensive schools and we didn't have as much money. As Nearly people. always private schools. Yeah. Um, and I just didn't... I didn't get on with those. You know, it was quite embarrassing, sort of being picked up in a sort of VW van while other people's were being picked up in helicopters. It was <laughs> like, you know, and I and I felt very uncomfortable in those places. And and also, I went to a couple of boarding schools as well out of London, thinking, you know, because family life was quite difficult at that time. So I thought boarding school was the answer. But actually, when I got there, it was 
No, I miss my friends I'm from London. I'm just thinking of your wardrobe full of school uniforms. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you arrive and they say, here's the new girl, here's Lily, and you think, sit down, and think, well, this is the 12th school, or whatever. I think my mum cottoned on pretty quickly that I wasn't going to stay anywhere for very long, so I think in my later years of education, they were always um, schools without uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> Were you, were you thrown out of them? I mean, were, were you... Were you a couple I was, yeah. <laughs> were you for being noisy, for being... <coughs> what? Do you remember? I think, um... There was one where I got, you know, caught, yeah, just doing bad things and hanging out with much older people than myself and smoking and drinking and, um... Yeah, you know, just e extracurricular activities. Was this an individual sort of rebellion? I mean, this was just you, or did you get with a gang of people? Did you fall, as they say, into bad company? Well, you know, company? My, my p both my parents are pretty protective over m my brother and myself, and I think, um, you know, we've, we've given the gift of the gab, and I think we could probably get our parents on side quite quickly, and my mum and dad tended to sort of... Not, sometimes not really like our educators very much. Really? <laughs> Convince them that they weren't nice people. Yeah, there's a funny contrast there. Must have been sometimes because I mean, there's one because you went to a Catholic school, I think, didn't mm -hmm. you? Quite, that was quite a long time, or was that? Yeah, and actually, that was one of my favourite. That was probably my favourite school, oddly enough. In fact, both my Catholic schools. So I went to St Joseph's Primary, and then Cavendish later on, which were both Catholic schools, and, and, you, and I enjoyed um, them both immensely. Did you? Yeah. Well, there must have been a bit of contrast, because there they were at school, teaching you in the Catholic school that uh, homosexuality was a sin, mm -hmm. adultery was a sin, drug-taking was a sin. Mm. A bit different to your own dear home life. Yeah, but at the same time, they were very uh, sort of protective and nurturing and caring of us, you know. I and mean, I remember it was at a particularly difficult time at home when my mum was going through a lot of struggles, and, you know, my dad wasn't really around much in those days. Um, and the teachers were very aware of what was going on, you know, in in our home lives, and and really looked out for us, and that felt nice. But how did you cope, Lily, with the fact that you there they're probably saying to you, homosexuality is a terrible well, sin? I just thought that that was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, your mum's friends are gay. Yeah, I think that you know I was quite capable of of um, looking at both at both things and sort of and thinking well yes I do enjoy this place but they are teaching me this and it does all seem You're only about silly. 13 though aren't you when we're talking about that? Younger I think probably <laughs> yeah l l l was before my 11 plus common entrance so I'm actually sort of 9 or 10 yeah. So you're, really, you're carrying almost two moralities in your head at the same time. I mean, you're saying the Hail Marys, are you? I mean, uh, did you become a Catholic or were you Well, it's interesting you should say this because um, I, we, we, I can't remember how it works, but you have your christening, don't you? And then you have your first communion. And your baptism, yeah. Yeah, and then you're meant to have your confirmation. Yeah. And I hadn't had my confirmation, but my mum had lied on the form and said that I had. So I remember we had to get up in, you know, in church and eat the body of Christ and drink the wine. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought I was going to hell because I hadn't been confirmed. That was a mortal <laughs> sin. <laughs> 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 and I used to say to my mum, I'd be like, Mum, I've got, we've got to be honest about this. I can feel we like, you know, feel like I'm going to go to hell because I'm eating the body of Christ. And she was like, Darling, if you feel that guilty, you're definitely a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> really? You'd almost feel the host burning on the tongue yeah. as you put it, as they put it on the tongue. <laughs> I know, I can remember that moment myself. But so, but, but that's so. It's but were you? Um, I know you. you what about singing at school? Were you doing anything at school? Were you doing any shows, or were you showing off? Were you singing? I think there was a story about that you did suddenly burst into an oasis. You suddenly burst into Wonderwall or something. Yeah. Well, I had. I mean, I was at. This is at Cavendish, the Catholic school we're talking about, and um, I think I had a, an, an English teacher. I can't remember her name. Rachel. No, no, no. That was my music teacher. But okay. I, I had another. I think it was Mrs. Miller, maybe, <laughs> and she. Um, was also the drama teacher and she um you know, we put on a production of the railway children and it was kind of like you know at that time where you want to be a girl really and um it was an all-girls school so obviously there were girls parts and boys parts and i was given the part of bert the railway master's son and um my my drama teacher didn't like me very much because i was probably a little bit mischievous um but she became quite ill very ill um, and had a replacement teacher uh, who was called Mrs. Santessa, or Miss Santessa, Rachel. That's Rachel, yes. Yeah. And um, I think she kind of saw me for what I was, which is sort of a child that probably needed a little bit of attention and was going about it in the wrong way. 
um, and I would listen to my Walkman in break time. And I was singing along to Oasis songs, and she walked past and she said, you should really try singing. And she gave me some one-to-one -one lessons, and then we prepared for a concert at school, and I sang, and all the parents came, and they cried and said that I should No one had singing. said that to you before, really? No, no. one had spotted it? No. Not your mum, even? No. No. That's been said. But her Rachel Santesso. My mum was probably scared to say it in case I went and <laughs> became a singer. Oh, really? <laughs> she did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She might have known that. That's Let, what let's she let's talk about uh, let's talk about <coughs> the home at the moment because, I mean, here you are at. Uh, I mean, I said already that you were at, you were at school and what they were being taught at school did seem to conflict a bit <laughs> with life at home. Mm. But it's it's a it's a story that we've talked about before, obviously with with your dad with Keith leaving at the age of four what, mm. I, what always struck me when I re read about it was almost there was like almost like a ritual leaving you've, you've mentioned a couple of times there was a moment in the hallway mm. where there was like almost a formal goodbye from Keith yeah I mean I was very young so and, you know you do piece together those moments in quite an odd way but I was four <clears throat> and um, yeah I mean my dad had been a very naughty boy and had done some things that he shouldn't have done and was very mean to my mum and um, you know, she quite rightly said, "Get out." And he, you know, we weren't aware of this obviously for we children. But um, but yeah, I remember there being a moment in the hallway in our flat in Bloomsbury, and you know, me and my mum and my sister, and my brother all being there, and my dad standing by the door, and um, and him saying, "Okay, I'm going now." And I remember thinking, "Is this are you going forever?" <clears throat> It doesn't kind of feel like a particularly painful memory. It's just that's just, just what it was, you know. Um, I remember sort of thinking, do we ha should we have to get a new one now? <laughs> get another one. Yeah. Mum, go out and find some. Well, there was another one because Harry Enfield yeah. arrived. Stepped in pretty quickly. Yeah. How quickly was that? Um, actually, it wasn't. She had she had another boyfriend called Ray who I don't really remember that much. I do remember coming home and him being led out of the house in a white boiler suit by a policeman, being taken off to jail. I don't know what for, never asked, actually. Um, and, yeah, and pretty soon after that, one got together with Harry. You've then got to suddenly cope with another dad. Yeah. Isn't that a bit difficult? Because rather, rather different personalities, I would have thought, as well. Not really, actually. I mean, the, I mean, they'd both hate for me to say, <laughs> to say that. They'd hate, hate you to say they were the same. Yeah, <laughs> both of them probably couldn't bear to hear that. Particularly Keith. Uh, and Harry, actually. Uh, you know, they weren't big fans of each other at all. Um, but they're both comedians and both quite grumpy. I was going to ask you about your split loyalties, because at night, you know, you're there at home with, with your brother, with Alfie, and your the television comes on. Your dad's on, or your stepdad's on. Mm. <laughs> do you, how, how do you how do you cope with that? Do you, do um, you remember those those occasions? Yeah, I mean, my dad always had a very bad reputation in our household, you know, and that was through no fault of his own. He wasn't very reliable, and um, but these are all things that are in the past it's now. Through no fault of his own, but I mean, and then you say he was unreliable. Well, he. Rick, well, he <laughs> He's just always been like that, you know, that's his personality. And my mother knew that that's what he was like when she got involved with him, you know. And he's still like that now. I mean, he's, ter you know, he's rubbish. He's, he's not a responsible adult. I mean, he, he lives in the countryside now, so he's not got so many distractions that he, he did before. But, you know, I, th I don't really blame my dad for how You mean he, he can't do anything about himself? Yeah, exactly. You know, and I kind of feel like I know that about him, so I still want to have a relationship with him, so I make the effort to go and see him. I don't expect him to come and see me just because I know, I know what he's like. And there's only so much you can just say, oh, that person's useless, because... It's pretty pointless. You said a funny thing there about him was I think you said that really this idea that he was terribly famous among your friends was simply not true. They didn't really ever notice him particularly. I'm not, I'm not a clue who he was. Except in an advert, I think. Yeah, the Listerine <laughs> The Listerine He was advert. a tooth fairy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what did, when you had, were you, I mean, you, you must have realised when you were sort of 13 or 14, OK, I've got, here are two rather famous people around me. Here's my dad, here's my stepmother. They're both very, very well known. They're both recognised. Mm-hmm. Does that make you feel that, well, you would like to be famous as well, you would like to be a star as well, or does it have the opposite effect? 
No, I think there was definitely an element of that. I think it was probably... I mean, I'm just sort of... From the outside looking in or looking at myself from at that age, I think I probably was fighting for a bit of attention my whole life because, you know, my brother and my sister and, and my dad and, you know, when we go into social situations, I always felt people were looking that little bit over my shoulder at what was going on behind me, you know, whether it was my dad or whether it was Harry. Um, so I think I probably was a, a little bit like, hey, I, maybe I can be the one that people look at for a bit. Interested in why it is, and this, this, this is maybe just telling you how old I am, but that you decide to write such personal songs immediately, or you decide that you're going to write your own songs, and they're going to be songs which are pretty well connected to your own experience in mm. some way. I mean, because if I look at your your heroes, I, I mean, I mentioned Dolly Parton. I think Dolly Parton is one that a person you like very much. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are people often sing other people's songs. I mean, and although their songs are moving and emotional, we don't really read them as an account of their lives. Mm. Your songs are like, like testaments. Your your heart is on your sleeve. Yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, I think. You know, growing up in the 90s and, you know, seeing what was happening in the early no noughties. Noughties, <laughs> that's a ridiculous yeah. era. <laughs> um, I felt very irritated by what what was going on around me in terms of pop culture um, and just the sort of marketing um, machine that was behind most of these people. And I think because I... You know, was in a uh, in a place where I would come into contact with these people quite a lot. You know, from hanging out with my dad. Tell me a bit more. What irritated you? I mean, you say the marketing machine, but the, what the music? The, the was well, just the music was rubbish. Wh uh, why? Why was it rubbish? What was rubbish? Well, it was like you know, these were the days of sort of like bands like S Club Seven and uh, I mean, like the Spice Girls, and just I mean, they were great for what they were, but they, you know, as someone who, you know, read a lot of books and you know engaged in conversation with people quite a lot. I just got... I've, I kind of felt felt like, if I'm going to be a pop star, I want to be a real pop star, and I want to say real things, and I would rather talk to my generation about... Um, you felt that was synthetic, too commercial? Yeah, I just felt... You know, it, it's quite scary, I think, as a child, to, to see all that stuff on your TV and think, is this the way the world is going? I don't... I don't really want to live in a world like this, so if I'm going to make music I'm gonna make it this way you see because when I listen to when I listen to you it, it is it, it's, it's extraordinary how straight away you make the connection and straight away it's somehow you speaking in mm. in a way that say you know other singers like Sinatra they're just singing other people's songs they sing here you are speaking directly it's very colloquial it's it's very very immediate and I just wondered how you like arrive at that point because it is qu it's quite it's it's quite it's quite sensational to come across it. Uh, uh, just did, did people say to you try it that way or did you push people aside and say this is the way I'm going to do it? I don't know. I just make it up. You know, I'm just I don't. It's not really f thought about. I mean, I try really hard to not sound cliche in my songs. So I guess the way in which I do that is by just being very honest. Are you rightly or wrongly? <laughs> no, but, but the songs are completely honest. I've heard you say, "Well, I feel something. I feel angry. I feel this." You know, it's almost become you. You 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 say this quite often. I I go into the studio. I feel this. I sit down. I write that. Mm. And you've said once, but what you write are are nursery rhymes, which is which is quite silly. Again, you're being far too self-deprecating well I don't know maybe if it was maybe if it felt like it was really hard I feel like I achieved something but I don't really it just kind of comes out of my head and I just sing it well how long does it take to write a song how long a couple of hours a couple of hours and do you do you do it because you have to do it because someone's waiting to record it or do you just do it because you have time or you you suddenly feel oh I'll do it at the moment now is it is it deadlines which make you produce them um, two hours it's extraordinary well I mean it's two hours to get a skeleton of a song then afterwards you know you're building it and record you know I like to write and record at the same time so um, you know I'll know pretty quickly whether something's gonna work or not and if it's working then we keep on 
you know, working on it. And if it isn't, then I toss it aside and start something new. But um, I, I'm, I think it is. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't write in my spare time, so it's, it's generally because someone else is there waiting. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel that because because the songs are so biographical, this is what when people are listening to them, they think that they know you very well, in the way that people listening to other singers don't feel that. Mm. So your audience have a feeling that they own you in a way that perhaps other audiences don't feel about other singers. Right. I never thought about it that way. Because people respond to you. If I look underneath, you know, if I look at any of the websites or anything like that, and I look underneath, there are people saying, I love you, Lily. I feel just the same as you. You say exactly what I say. There's, there's all of that mm. going on down... Does that not happen with other bands? I don't think it happens so much, because your, your heart is on your sleeve so much. It's, it's right. like a confessional. If you go out with a man who can't make it in bed, you write about not being able to make it in bed. If your father seems to have let you down, you write a song about the fact that he wasn't there. Mm. I mean, this is very, very, very close to your heart. And I wonder if using up all that personal stuff, putting it into the public arena, makes life a little bit difficult for you because you've, you've almost given your personality, yourself, to your fans, to your listeners, in the way that other people don't. Yeah, but, I mean, to be honest, you know... As hard as things have been with my dad and stuff, like, I don't think I've ever cried because my dad's behaved the way that he has. You know, I don't... Other people might, hit, sit, you know, hear that song about my dad and go, oh, my gosh, my dad's been awful too. I'm really upset about that. I don't feel like that. I just feel like my dad's a bit useless and um, it's quite an interesting idea to write a song about. Yeah. <laughs> But this, but that, it, but so, well, you, you've, you've in a way answered my question. But it, it is almost as though your, all your, your life is told in song a bit, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely a way of sort of communicating feelings. But I mean, not necessarily things that I'm really emotional about. I mean, actually, saying that smile was about my first boyfriend, who really did break my heart, and I was, you know, really in pieces over it. Um, but. Generally, I get upset about really stupid things. More of think about the future than the past. It's got to be said. What stupid things? What upset you? Oh, I don't know. What was the last thing that upset you? Um, EastEnders last night. <laughs> I cried. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. You know, I cry about things that I have no control over, like the way that I look or... Um, yeah, you know, how much weight I've put on or, um, you know, if I feel like, um, you know, I might not make my mortgage payments that month or, you know, it's just things that, you know, I would very rarely cry about relationships with other people or get upset about them. Tell me, because I'm, what I'm suggesting before by that about the songs being so personal, that in a way when the personal is put out into the public arena, it's in a way makes it difficult to know what is personal, what is exactly your own. Mm. And when you write about uh, celebrity, when you write about, um, you, you know, about the ambiguity, the ambivalence of celebrity, you know, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to be famous, I'm going to take all my clothes off, I'm going to be shameless, this is how I become famous. Mm. When you write about... This also, you're, you're commenting upon the very fact of your own fame as well, aren't you? Uh, no, actually, I mean that song was. I wrote that song when I was, <laughs> when I was like, yeah, in, in the countryside writing. And I went out f in the local town that afternoon, and there was this little girl, who must have been about six or seven. And she was wearing a tiny little pink crop top with some sort of hot pants, and I just thought, oh, God, I bet you she reads all those ghastly magazines, and that she wants to be a pop star when she's older. And it was more a song to those, to to that generation, you know. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's kind of ironic because it's only after I wrote that song that I started getting my boobs out. <laughs> 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 um, but I kind of thought that that was, that was sort of funny. What do you think about because... I like to have fun with it all, you know. I really don't take it very seriously at all. 
But the other thing is that the way we talked about people identifying with you, and what, you know, when I just look at the websites and look at all these people saying, "Oh, and I have a, a um, I have a researcher on my radio program. We've got a twelve-year-old girl who goes around singing your songs all the time, and mm. she has to occasionally tell her to stop singing your songs because she thought, that's not suitable. Stop singing that." But absolutely identifies with you. You do run into the trouble. These people are so closely identified with you that. You could. I, I know this is. You. You always. I, I've seen you sort of rise up in anger at this, but the suggestion really that you're doing some harm to these 12 and 13 year olds because they're listening to your songs and your songs are not suitable for them. We've had David Cameron coming out recently, being nasty about you. Well, saying that he wouldn't let his six-year-old yeah. listen to my songs. Yeah. Well, I hope he wouldn't give his six-year-old cigarettes either. I mean, it's got a parental advisory sticker on the front. You know, it's not. It's not made for children. It's made for me, and whoever seems to like it, want to buy it, then that's their... I find the question a bit boring, but I'm still going to ask it, because I suppose we've got to, we've got to do that sort of role model stuff, haven't we? We've got to, I've got to ask you, don't you think you've got some sort of, I don't know, vague responsibility to all these millions of 15, 14, 16 year olds who hang on your every word? And they do Yeah, hang but on you know what? I'm very honest th in my lyrics, and I don't feel ashamed about anything that I feel, so... If I'm on being honest, then it can't be that bad because I'm not a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a little bit disingenuous because I'm, I'm just saying because people believe in you so much, it's not quite like some other singers, some other artists, because people think that they are you. D doesn't that make? I think a you know what. Generally, you know the people who've got the most riled about this record is men and there's a song about it which is about men not performing in bed very well generally women respond to it in a brilliant way unless they write for the daily mail um and and yeah so i don't i just kind of think it's all a bit silly really you know i don't i don't tell people to go out and take drugs i don't even tell people to drink in fact i don't even drink that much i drink a couple of glasses of wine before I go on stage. The reason you'll see pictures of me falling out of nightclubs is because I'm a terrible drinker. And when I do drink, I fall out of nightclubs, so I don't do it that often. But there again, you see, your honesty gets you into in, into trouble, doesn't it? Because I mean, cause over that drugs thing, I, I mean, I remember reading that and thinking, oh, thank goodness someone said something sensible at last. You said something very simple about, you know, you knew people who used cocaine and they got up and went to work the next day. And that's a straightforward thing, you mm -hmm. know. Hundreds, and hundreds of thousands, and thousands of people could also say that about other people they knew, mm. and yet you're immediately in trouble, aren't you? Because people say, "Ah, oh, ah, oh, this sounds like she's sanctioning drugs." Yeah, I think, you know, I. <laughs> you remember that bit? Yeah, I do. I remember it, but I just—it's funny because I used to. I remember getting so passionate and riled up about this conversation when, at the time when it happened, and now I just look at it and just laugh because. You know, it, the the newspaper industry and the journalism industry is, I mean, it's almost a bit of a joke now. I mean, you know, the Evening Standard is a free newspaper. I mean, there's, it doesn't really exist anymore. So it's all sensationalist and rubbish. And I happen to be one of the most famous people in the country. So if I say something controversial, it's going to get blown out of proportion. But that's not going to stop me from being it's not gonna honest stop you. about what. Well, it will stop me. It'll stop me from being a pop star. And, and and having those conversations with people, I'll just, you know, have my same views but go into something different. Where because it's easier for sort of older people to be, you know, more honest about this. I mean, if I said something about, you know, knowing lots of people, you know, I'm taking notes whatsoever, just elderly professor, you know. Just, but you said, but you have to retract it really, then, didn't you? I mean, you had to go back and say, oh well, I'm sorry, you know, drugs are very bad for people. It's terrible. You were forced into a retraction, which I suppose is almost saying, look. Lily, you can only be so honest. Stop being quite so honest. Well, no, I didn't really retract it. I apologised to the people that it had offended, you know, the, fa the families of people who are really negatively affected by drugs, and yes, they do exist, but that wasn't really what I was trying to say, you know. People will mash up your words to make them sound like anything. Funny, by the way, isn't it, Cameron objecting to your lyrics? I thought Cameron gave Obama... One of, one of my albums. Yeah, and also I thought his favourite record that he likes to listen to with his kids was the Arctic Monkeys, and their album, if I'm not mistaken, is all about one night stands and prostitution. But never mind, I don't know. <laughs> Bit of hypocrisy there. Do you get, because you're political, I should imagine you're political. I you take know. an interest in politics. Oh, that's very, very... <laughs> that's very, that's <laughs> very, very political. I'm answer. not going to let you be as... You can't be as careful as that. You... <laughs> I mean, you can't. Have, you, I mean, you can't. I mean, you go on. You still see a lot of your dad. I mean, you, so you, you must be pretty left wing, reasonably left wing. I mean, 
Even though I'm not putting you into a slot, but... Yeah, I'd say I'm pretty left-wing. So... Anyone ever tried to get you to work for the, the Labour Party or come on side or do something for them? Both parties frequently try Both to parties. get me involved, yeah. But bring you up, approach you? Not personally, but they have people that have asked me to get involved. Really? A bit of hypocrisy going on here then, isn't there? <laughs> Weird, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so one day they're denouncing you in the press, but the next day you're getting little... I don't, yeah, know, I don't think uh, they would be denouncing me in the press if I'd turned up to the Conservative Party conference a few weeks ago. Um, uh, oh, I think. Well, you got an invite? Yeah. <laughs> <Did you? laughs> I got an invite to the Labour one as well, though. <laughs> I'm so curious. You don't have to tell me, but I have to. What's an invite look like? Does it say, dear Lily, you know. It's not. It doesn't really work. Like, it's more of, um, you know, emails and, f and phone calls rather than actual posh handwritten invitations yeah yeah well this business you see because some when we were talking about honesty before because some people have said you're not honest because you come across as working class here i am just ordinary absolutely ordinary person and yet your upbringing as we've already said here you are hundred thousand quid perhaps spent on private education as you're brought up mm -hmm. and people always bring up fake chav taunt how do you respond to that are you slightly aware of going just a bit down market no being a bit more matier than you really are no i wear girl? really expensive clothes i talk in quite a posh voice so i don't i think maybe because i sing in an english accent people take that as being cockney but not What's really. my, what, what do you mean an English accent? Because you don't sing in that voice that you're talking to me in now, do you? It but it'd be like quite that. hard. To, it's quite. It's di you know. There's a reason that people sing in an American accent. It's because it's easier and it flows easier. You couldn't sing in an English accent like mine unless you were doing classical music. You know, it just wouldn't work. So it's only because I'm trying to make it sound as if it, you know, can can flow properly. So it's, 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 it's... I mean, it'd be quite silly to sort of sing, and I'm being taken over by the fear. I mean, it would sound ridiculous, and no one would buy it, so I'm not going to sing like that. All those things associated with being... You've used the word, the phrase, pop star yourself, and you are a pop star. <laughs> Does it seem like a part you're just... It sounds a bit as though it's a part you thought, I'll have a go, I'll play this part, I'll do it, I'll be a pop star... And now it sounds as though you're going to be something else. Yeah, it does. I mean, you have to take into account as well when you start recording an album to the, to, to, you know, when you start promoting it to the end, you know, um, you can't just back out there and then. You know, you have to wait until the end of a cycle, um, because you know, gigs, you know, have been penciled in for f a year or something. So you're always sort of working towards the end, and it's now it's sort of fizzling out and I've got the time to concentrate on other stuff but um but you spoke about yourself as like Lily Allen the the pop star yeah you've because had a, you've had enough of that I'm not quite sure what it is you've had enough of you presumably haven't had enough of the because, cars because I think that you know because maybe it's because people you know when I, uh, whatever situation I go to whether it's a supermarket or whether it's you know going to the pub or a club in town or in the back of a cab People do think that they know me, and the reality is that they don't know me. They don't know me at all. What they do know about me is something they've read in a newspaper, which is something that someone has written about me. That person's never met me. So, I mean, it's... You know, Lily Allen is, is a person that people don't know. She's a character, which I have no control over. So I kind of laugh at it, because it's <laughs> got nothing to do with me. <laughs> Except for my face is the one that goes with it. That's, that's all it is. You think of... You think you almost have an idea there is someone called Lily Allen who is other than you, who is not you. No, I mean I know that I am Lily Allen, but I I also am quite realistic in, in the sense that I know that she's not. You know, if I believed all of that stuff that I read about myself, I would hate myself, and I don't. So, you know, I have, I have the ability to read it and just go, oh God, they're writing about that 
other person that doesn't exist. You know, they have a preconceived idea of who I am, they see this picture, and they go, oh, that goes well with this other story that I read about her a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, and then they come up together with their own conclusions, and it's just like they couldn't have it more wrong. And I've got no control over it, and I just don't care. Don't you mm. think, just think about this, though, that I, you see plenty of people who say, who are pop stars, let's use that daft expression for a moment, of pop stars, then they suddenly say, right, I'm, I'm going to write a novel now, I'm going to be an actor now, I'm going to produce a musical now, and off they go and do it. But then they really rather miss the sort of attention that a pop star gets. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 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 you know, the sort of service, the cars, the hairdressers, the attention, the lights, the... All of those things which can occasionally seem a nag to you and a worry to you, and I wish I didn't have to bother with this. Mm. Don't you think you might miss them if they went there? Supposing your next venture doesn't really work out in the way that you hope it will, mightn't you think, oh dear, perhaps I should have stayed as a pop star? No, I think I'll probably, you know, help my boyfriend. Will you? In, um, in making his business a success. Did you contemplate failure after so much success? Yeah. You could cope with it? Yeah. I coped with it before. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, I... You know, as this has been winding down, you know, my touring from this record and, you know, the Brit Awards and all of the other, you know, high-profile things, you know, I've been starting up my other two businesses at the same time so it's you know I need to, I definitely need to dive from one thing into another and you know I do have people that I need to you know keep on the payroll I've got an assistant she's vital in my life and so is my driver and you know I don't I very rarely have hair and makeup people I just sort of tend to do it myself and if I'm doing something like I do today then you know I don't bring my own people I get you lot to pay for it I don't really I'm not I'm, I'm not fussy about that kind of stuff. But you have, there have been times when things have got too much for you. Yeah. But I probably need to remind you, what, back January 2008, sometime like that, when probably as a result, or after miscarriage, mm -hmm. you got very depressed. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you feel that you got over completely? It was just a, a temporary little thing, a temporary little reaction to... A, a terrible misfortune or do you carry with you the idea that this is there is something within you that perhaps is prone to that type of depression um do you occasionally feel it coming back at any time or is it all gone no i don't i mean I've, i work with a therapist on a regular basis so i'm you know i'm quite capable of noticing when you know when I'm taking a turn for the worse and and at that point I say right I'm not working for the next month and I've got to take time to concentrate on myself um and I had to do that in January of 2008 yeah I just want to push gently here but I don't want to be in, invade your privacy more than necessary but when you say that you you work with a, a therapist as mm -hmm. though there's you feel a continual need for someone to talk to? Well, no, actually, I haven't spoken to him for a um, good five months or something now. But, you know, if I felt there were sort of, sort of repetitive negative thoughts going around in my head, then, you know, I've had enough, his, you know, mental history to, to know to call someone for help at that point. And I have a relationship with him, and so I'd call him. And um, you know he'd put me in for you know a meeting straight away, and I'd go and have a chat and see if I need to meet him Repetitive again. Repetitive negative thoughts about yourself, or about yeah, or the world generally. You know, if I mean, I think if it's um, if it's you know negative thoughts about the world and a sort of you know lack of control over things that are going on around me, then it generally I can write that off as being sort of temporary bouts of depression, if it's more about myself, then, then it gets a bit more serious. It would seem to me, very glibly, just re reading about you, that, that you put yourself down a, a, an awful lot. Uh, we mentioned this earlier, but you also have said, I would like to feel that I've done something real. I would like to feel that I'm, I don't think you've ever said an intellectual, but I've 
you've said I would like to feel more intellectual. But, uh. you, but why do you say that? You strike me as highly intelligent, and you've done an awful lot. Where, where does that dissatisfaction come from? Do you really feel that you're not intelligent? That you're um, no, I don't think it's not intelligent. I think I, f I really struggle because I don't feel very passionate about anything. Um, you know, I don't really have a hobby, and um, and I wish that I could get. Sometimes I wish that I could get more excited about things, be less cynical. Because they made you a judge for the Orange Fiction, but, mm -hmm. but, but and sadly, I think that that coincided with the time that you were having. Some mm. treatment for that depression at the beginning of two th two thousand and eight. That must have been quite a nice acknowledgement. You know, that you thought, okay, they've asked you to read novels and to judge novels. Yeah, it was, and it was. It was a great thing to be involved with. It was sad that it w that it went. Yeah, wrong. you were very pissed off, weren't you? Because they said because you couldn't attend the meetings. You yeah. couldn't go on with it. But that but to concentrate on that intelligence bit again, though, just just a tiny bit more. I mean, why? What is it? I mean, presumably, I mean, you, 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 you read, you understand, you talk. Why? Why does something occur to you that there's still something you haven't done, as though you haven't made it's your? Probably because I didn't finish school. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> I mean, I'd say. I mean, I don't know if it is, but I do feel like sometimes, you know, I'm 24. Most people my age have just got out of university a couple of years ago, and you know, I've been flying off around the world, hanging out with some. You know, vacuous idiots, and um, and <laughs> that makes me sad sometimes. But at the same time, you know, I've got two properties, and you know, I've set myself up for for a little while. That does this relate to that? I, I don't know what anything about your your personal life at the moment, but you, this person about older men always comes in, doesn't it? When people are talking to you, is this is, uh, this suggests as were a game that you feel really that you want to hang around with an older man because they're going to tell you things or they're going to be sort of like daddyish towards you and sort of show you how to read good books and lend you copies of plays. Yeah, I guess there was probably an element of they made me feel a bit more like a grown-up. You know, if these, you know, much older, and it's not older men, it's much older men I think you're referring to. Um, much older men? Yeah, I mean, if they were taking me out for dinners with their friends and, you know, to yachts in the Caribbean or wherever it was that you know they'd take me and f didn't feel embarrassed to have me around and it kind of made me feel a little bit like maybe I can hang out with older people. <laughs> Funny isn't it? it? You still it's almost as though what you lack as though you want you you want more praise as though you feel you haven't achieved anything. Yeah. You really feel you haven't achieved anything. <laughs> um. I don't know, you know. I'm mean, gonna. I'll give you an example. I got this Brit Award last week. Yes. Um, and that was something that four years ago I would have died for. You know, I was re I was nominated for five and I didn't get any, and I was really upset. And but I got one last week, and it just meant absolutely nothing to me. I'll be honest with you. And I think that's because, you know. F I know now that the Brit Awards is. Um, you know, it's a TV show, and record company executive makes deals with the ITV and the producers about who wins what award in exchange for performance time. So it just became a non-award. It's like, oh, thank you for this. You become cynical. Yeah. It's not cynical. It's just I know, and I've seen it happen. I've seen the deals go on. And when you look at last question, wh when you look out at the world of show business, popular music. Is there somebody out there who you think has managed their life in a way which seems to you to be a pretty good model that yeah. you occasionally think, I must be more like them? Kate Bush. Because she just vanishes off behind some hedge and then comes back when she feels like it. <laughs> she just goes away and yeah. comes back. She just doesn't get involved with any of the, you know, the bollocks of it all. But she never did, anyway, because you you you, you yeah. finally followed the Kate Bush model for a few no, years. No, no, of course, and 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 I wish that I I I had. You know, I definitely got sucked in and attracted by something that I thought was real, and now that I've realised that it is, and 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 it's not necessarily something that I really want to be a part of. You know, you'll see me gravitate away from it all. Later in life, when you look back upon this 
period of your life, the period from, say, 16, 17 to 24, will it just seem like a, a part you played, like a, an act you played for a time that was not really you especially, but was just part of you, and now you've moved to a different sort of you? Yeah, I mean, it does almost seem like an act. It seems like a sort of, you know, a comedy or something. Is I mean, it? Sam and I, you know, we sit at home watching EastEnders or Coronation Street and one of my songs will come on in the caf or in the pub and I'll giggle. I'll just be like, oh, no, I really am a pop star on Coronation Street. Um, and he just, go, you know, tuts and just goes, that's ridiculous. And, you know, we get on with our evening and that's it. You know, that's, that's my attitude towards it.